안녕하세요. Welcome to the KCB International Friends webinar series. This is a fifth installment of this series. And today we have very special guests and a very sp special guests and we have a very special topic. Uh, today we would like to share with you the a topic under the investment treaty protections for Korean investors. And um, the friends that are helping us this time are the very excellent lawyers of Allen and Overy and um, a very well-known uh, uh, well known expert from FDI Consulting in, in Singapore. Um, the explanation of the topic and its importance will be provided to you by our guest speakers. Uh, but for now, I'd like to welcome you. And also I would like to introduce you to Professor Hitek Shin, Chairman of KC Bear International, who will give you a few open remarks on this topic. So, Professor Shin, um, it's up to you now. 안녕하세요. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth KCAB International and Friends webinar today. To start with, my appreciation goes to our friends at Allen and Overy for co-hosting today's webinar with KCAB International. I would like to thank Mr. Matthew Gearing, Matthew Hosson, and Jay Hiso from Allen and Overy, and also Mr. James Nicholson from FTI Consulting for sharing invaluable expertise on some of the key issues of investment arbitration for the benefit of Korean investors doing business overseas. As you may well aware, Korean companies have been very active players in cross-border business transactions from importing and exporting of various, of various goods to overseas construction and infrastructure projects, as well as overseas capital investment. Inevitably, they occasionally face substantial number of disputes in the conduct of their disputes, uh, their business, whether they like it or not. The statistics of major international arbitral institu institutions show that Korean parties are among top users of international arbitration. As compared with their Western counterparts, however, Korean companies so far have had very little use of investor state arbitrations. According to UNCTAD statistics, there are only seven known investment arbitration cases filed by Korean parties. Respondent states include Vietnam, China, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Kyrgyzstan, Libya, and India. The rather limited number of cases notwithstanding, some Korean investors, such as a construction company in SK Group and construction company in Samsung Group, utilize investment arbitration to the successful resolution of their disputes with host states. It's a very positive signal to other Korean companies in a similar situation. Considering the rather apparent waves of politically motivated, radical, discriminatory, or extremely unfair national measures targeting foreign investors and their investment in some parts of the world in recent years, the need to seek effective product protection from the host government measures would continue to increase in the future. In the disputes with host states, commercial arbitration would not be available to Korean investors unless an arbitration agreement is in place with the host states. Such is not the case in most of the instances. As Jae Hee So will present, Korea has one of the most extensive network of international investment agreements, including the bilateral investment treaties, BIT, and investment chapters in 
free trade agreements. This web of investment agreements allows Korean investors to resort to investment arbitration if they have disputes with host states in more than 100 jurisdictions. Furthermore, Korea has been a contracting state of exit convention since 1967. Therefore, the enforcement of investment arbitration is simpler for Korean companies uh, than the enforcement of commercial arbitration awards. KCAB has been on the forefront of disseminating the utility of international investment arbitration to Korean business communities since 2007. In 2007, KCAB established an ISDS monitoring center to keep an eye on trends and development in investment dispute around the world. The center has been actively publishing reports on major cases and also holding monthly forum called ISDS Forum. Recently, Seoul International Dispute Resolution Center, which is a part of KCAB, has successfully hosted ISDS hearings, hearings for, of investment arbitration, both physical and virtually uh, involving Korean parties. I am sure that you will find today's webinar very info informative and useful in understanding investment arbitration as a meaningful tool for Korean companies doing business overseas. As you know, Alan and Overy, our good friends, is one of the most experienced law firm in this field of law with a proven record. Likewise, FTI Consulting has demonstrated expertise in remedies, in particular, damage assessment. We at KCAB International will continue to offer info informative sessions on dispute resolution with leading experts in our KCAB International and Friends webinars. So I hope you stay tuned and most importantly, you stay safe in times of uncertainty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shin. Thank you, Professor Shin. Um, and now, uh, and now I'll turn the floor to Jay He Saw of Allen Overy Singapore. Uh, Jay He is a senior associate who is, a, is specialized in international arbitration with particular background on investment treaty. Um, and I'll let Jay He, uh, who I know very well, to introduce the other speakers and also the topic as well. Jay, up to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. 안녕하세요. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hopefully, you can see my slides fine. As Im Byung-sun-nim has kindly introduced me, I'm a senior associate at Allen & Overy. I'm originally from Korea and currently based in Singapore. As a loyal follower of the KCA, the International and Friends series, I'm delighted to be co-hosting this fifth session. Through this webinar, we would hope to provide you with a framework for understanding and utilizing investment treaty protections available to Korean investors. Now, I'll first introduce the speakers and the topics. The three of us today are from Allen & Overy's arbitration team. We're an international firm with 44 offices around the globe. Our sole office, which was established in 2015, is located in Yeoido. Investment treaty arbitration, or Investor State Dispute Settlement, in short, ISDS, is a big part of Allen & Overy's practice. We also frequently advise clients during the investment planning stage to help them benefit from investment treaty protections. I'm joined by two partners from Allen & Overy's Hong Kong office with extensive experience in ISDS. 
Matthew Gearing QC is our global co-head of international arbitration and the joint editor of the leading textbook, Russell on Arbitration. Matthew Hodgson is an investment treaty specialist and Matthew is also part of the practitioner group supporting United Nations Commission on International Trade Law on the ISDS reform. Matt and Matthew are both on KCID's panel of arbitrators and they regularly work with Korean clients. We're also very lucky to be joined by our wonderful guest speaker, Mr. James Nicholson. James is the head of Asia Economic and Financial Consulting of FTI Consulting. James is based in Singapore and is one of the leading quantum experts for both commercial and treaty arbitrations. And we're very lucky to have him as our guest today. This slide sets out the topics we will cover today. Given the limited time, we'll focus on providing you with the framework for identifying the treaty protections. Do reach out to us if we're unable to address your questions during the webinar. And if you fill your questions through the Q&A box, we will endeavor to address as many of them as we can at the end of our session. Now I'll briefly introduce investment treaties and treaty arbitration for those who are new to the topic. As Shinite Gujangmi has already described, Koreans and Korean companies are very active cross-border investors. Korean investors may face various different forms of interference from the foreign state that they're investing in, and we'll call this foreign state for our purposes, the host state. For example, the host state may introduce a new law which makes the investment much less profitable or cancel a license or project that's vital to the investment's success. Korean investors facing such interference may not be sufficiently protected under local law. And this is where investment treaties come in. At their core, investment treaties are agreements between states for promotion of investment. From the perspective of investors, the treaties are useful in two main ways. First, treaties provide investors with protections under international law against actions of the host state that may harm the investment. For example, where such actions are discriminatory or in breach of the reasonable expectations of the investors at the time of the investment. And crucially, these protections are available even if the host state action in question is legal under the local law. And secondly, treaties also give a direct right of action against the host state. In other words, the investors can directly sue the host state for actions in breach of the treaty. And this mechanism is commonly referred to as ISDS or Investor State Dispute Settlement. Prior to the introduction of ISDS, Korean investors had limited options when faced with the host state interference, such as local proceedings or diplomatic protection involving Korea, Korea as the home state. These options were not always available or desirable, especially if the investors do not have any contractual relationship with the host state. Importantly, they did not allow investors to directly sue the host state before a neutral international forum. This changes with the ISDS, which provides such a direct right of action without the need for any intervention from the home state, so in our case, Korea, or a contractual relationship between the investors and the host, host state. This diagram here illustrates how this works. If there is an investment treaty between Korea as the home state and the host state the, that the Korean investor is investing in, then the Korean investor can bring a direct claim against the host state, relying on the bond of nationality to Korea, even where there is no contractual mechanism in place. Now, there are currently more than 2,600 investment treaties in force globally, and as Sunit Rizangim has already 
as already explained, Korea has an extensive investment treaty network with more than 100 investment treaties in force. And they cover most of the countries Korean investors are active in, such as the UK, US, China, ASEAN, Australia, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. This makes Korea's investment treaty network one of the most extensive ones in the region, second only to China's. And in fact, in qualitative terms, so focusing on the overall quality of the network as opposed to pure quantity or the numbers, one could say that Korea's treaty network is indeed the best in the region and one of the best in the world. This is because, as Matt will discuss in more detail during his presentation, almost all of Korean treaties provide for the most important and most often successful basis for investor claims, the Fair and Equitable Treatment, or FET, standard. Further, Korea's treaties generally include a broad ISDS provision, which covers a wide range of treaty protections. In contrast, Many of China's BITs limit the scope of ISDS to protection against expropriation or compensation for it. Again, as Professor Shin mentioned, despite Korea's impressive treaty network, Korean investors have not been frequent users of the ISDS to date. As, according to public information, there have only been seven reported claims made by Korean investors. Globally, in contrast, there have been more than 1,000 ISDS cases across different sectors, as set out here, from oil, energy, construction, to finance and IT. Now, I'll conclude with a high-level comparison between commercial arbitration on, on the one hand and ISDS on the other, given that many in the audience are quite familiar with the commercial arbitration. Procedurally, they can be quite similar, involves constitution of the tribunal, exchange of pleadings, etc., and they can even be subject to the same set of arbitral rules. Both commercial and treaty disputes can also arise in any sector. A major difference, and the one that our speakers will focus on today, is what the substantive dispute is governed by. In commercial arbitration, it is governed by contract and local law, and in ISDS, it is governed by treaty provisions and international law. And with that, now I'll hand over to Matt to give us an overview of key features in Korea's investment treaties. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, all but virtually. It's a pleasure to be here with our um, very good friends in Korea, including, of course, the distinguished Professor uh, Hai Tak Shin and um, our good friend uh, Sue Lim at KCAB. Um, thank you, everyone, for logging on. Thank you, uh, Jay He, for your introduction. I'm now going to take up the banner and run through an anatomy of investment treaties, and I'm going to focus on substantive provisions. Um, if one then turns to the typical structure um, of investment treaties, one sees there on the screen um, um, in slide, typical structure of investment treaties, it's effectively threefold. Um, one it deals, first of all, or looks typically at jurisdictional requirements. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, then to substantive protections. And then thirdly, one needs to focus on the relevant dispute resolution um, mechanism. So if we can then turn to the next slide, um, taking up the first of those points, definitions or looking at investors and investments. Those are the two questions you need to ask yourself um, at the start or the potential start of any investment treaty case. Um, are you a qualifying investor? And do you have a qualifying investment? Now, there's a lot of law and a lot of writing in both of those questions, um, but they are the twin peaks, the two essential questions which um, arise at the jurisdictional phase. Um, 
investor, let me just say something briefly about that. Um, as we say in the top left hand side of the slide, careers investment treaties generally adopt a broad definition. Um, any natural or juridical person, um, so that can be an individual um, or a company, typically those are the two most common types of investors, but, but other types of um, legal entities, juridical persons could sue, although they're rarely in a position to do so. Um, the most interesting question which tends to arise in the context of an investor um, is whether um, and in, there's a lot of law here, but whether an investor can establish an investment in a particular state without having any substantial connection in that state um, for and then take advantage of um, an investment treaty claim. Um, right at the bottom of the slide on the left hand side, you see a reference to abuse of process objection. Philip Morris and Australia. That is a reference to a claim bought by Philip Morris. In fact, Philip Morris Hong Kong, effectively. Philip Morris Asia Limited Hong Kong against Australia. Philip Morris was suing Australia for introduction of um, stringent packaging restrictions on um, cigarette packages. Um, but the claim was knocked out or struck out um, at the jurisdictional phase because the tribunal said that the investment had been rehoused or moved into the Hong Kong entity effectively for the purpose of or when there was a reasonable prospect um, that the dispute with Australia would materialise. So in other words, it was a, a abusive restructuring. Um, so that's the question which arises very often in the context of um, investors, what kind of connection um, do they have to have, what kind of activity do they have to undertake in the state that they're claiming nationality from. Um, or um, to use a you know, very English phrase, you know, can it, can, it, can it simply be a letterbox? Can you simply establish a letterbox, a PO box in a particular country and claim on that base basis? Um, invest a month. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, I won't go through all of that, but investments are broad. I mean, I think the shortest and simplest point is that investments are not um, obviously not qualified to just or restricted to just physical assets. So they don't have to be power stations, dams, office blocks, motorways, airports. They can be um, interests in shares, um, in, in companies. Um, interestingly, they can be debts, financial products and loans, etc., cetera, um, and a host of other less um, tangible um, interests. So the short point on investments is they are broad or normally construed very broadly. Um, in terms of substantive provisions, now moving on to the next slide, I'm going to touch briefly, if you see on slide, the slide substantive protections. I won't have time to delve into all of these. There are two big, again, twin peaks, two big guns, if you like, of protections. They're fair and equitable treatment and nationalisation and expropriation, effectively expropriation. Um, it is a very rare um, investment treaty case where there is not a claim for either fair and equitable treatment or expropriation. Um, and very often they are combined. Um, very often if there is a fair and equitable treatment claim there will be an indirect, what's called an indirect expropriation claim alongside. Um, but those are the two protections that attract most attention. Um, you can see the other, other typical ones, um, there's no absolute universal standard but you can see the other typical ones listed. Um, in the other four colourful circles on that slide. So now let us turn to fair and equitable treatment or FET. Um, as the first blob says um, under the site from the Korean, uh, Korea, <coughs> excuse me, Vietnam VAT, it's the most usual um, basis for bringing a claim. Most um, often invoked and most successful basis. Um, 
In older treaties, as we say in the second blue blob, um, it is this protection is very openly worded um, and therefore it potentially at least allows for a broader interpretation um, of the scope of the protection. And in particular, there is normally a debate in the context of older treaties about how far the fair and equitable treatment protection goes. Is it limited um, to customary international protections under customary international law protections, or does it create something more? Um, what you now see, and this is what the third blob touches on, is that a significant number of more modern treaties um, concluded by Korea and concluded by other Asian countries and indeed other countries generally um, expressly cut back or um, expressly define the FET standard and they limit it in several ways actually including as we say in the third blog by making it clear that it is only it equates only to the customary international law minimum standard of treatment. It doesn't go any further than that. Some other more modern treaties um, also contain additional restrictions on the FET right. Nonetheless, it's still important. It's still an important cause of action, even under more modern, more modern treaties. Let's move then, there's much more to say about FET, but that is, if you like, a, a taster. Let's move on to expropriation because, as I say, it's the other big gun or um, the other um, often frequent, frequently invoked cause of action. Um, so that's the next slide. And what one sees um, there um, one, um, is a distinction between direct takings, um, what we have said in the second blob, outright takings, um, or indirect expropriation, measures tantamount to expropriation. Now, outright takings are um, much more dramatic, they're much more easy, they're easy to characterize, um, but they rarely um, occur. Um, there's a reference to two cases in brackets in the first blue blob there, Repsol and Argentina, Dunkeld and Belize. Um, I was involved acting for Dunkeld in the second of those cases and that was a very dramatic taking. That was a direct nationalisation by the government of Belize of um, the foreign investors stake in the um, telecoms, in Belize Telecom, um, the, the telecoms business in Belize, which is a Central American country. And so there were other issues in that case, but it was reasonably obvious that that was an expropriation and indeed the government didn't contend otherwise. Um, However, what you normally end up arguing about in expropriation cases, or what's normally the focus, is the second part of this slide, the indirect expropriation or measures tantamount to expropriation. Um, what, um, as the slide says, is sometimes called creeping or re regulatory expropriation, gradual expropriation, if you like. Um, and that would target a series of steps which over time um, renders the, invest the investor's investment either completely valueless or essentially valueless. Um, you have to show um, a substantial loss of value, an almost total loss of value, um, in order to normally in order to get an, a decent expropriation claim. Um, off the ground to, to sustain a decent expropriation claim. Um, again, there is much more to say about expropriation, um, but again, that is a taster. If we can then move on to um, non-discrimination um, or most favoured nation treatment. And you see um, at the top of the slide there, there was a reference to a now a pretty typical provision, this one taken from the Korea US FTA. Um, these protections are important um, because they 
essentially what they seek to do is um, rule out um, discrimination against investors on the grounds only of their nationality. So national treatment is pretty obviously an obligation to treat foreign investors no less favorably than um, one's own domestic investors. Um, and the MFN or most favored nation treatment is an obligation to treat investors um, at least as favorably or as favorably as investors from a third country. Um, in the interest of time, um, let me then move briefly to um, umbrella clauses. Um, one of my favourites because I've spent a lot of time in the past um, arguing about the scope of an umbrella clause and it is um, the substantive protection that excites or attracts a lot of writing and a lot of academic interest. So an umbrella clause typically would look like Article 10.2, for example, there of the Korea China BIT. Each contracting party shall observe any commitments it may have entered into with the investors of the other contracting party as regards their investments. And the big question, the one that has been much argued about, is is the whether or the extent to which um, it allows an investor to sue the state for essentially contractual breaches, but under the jurisdictional mechanism in the treaty. So in the bottom right hand corner of that slide, there is a reference to SGS Philippines. I and my colleagues acted for the Philippines in that case, and that concerned a um, contract that the Ministry of Finance of the Philippines had entered into with Société Générale de Surveillance to effectively organise part of the Philippines customs services. There was a dispute, there was a dispute over allegedly unpaid fees and other things. In the contract, there was a domestic dispute resolution provision requiring SGS to take disputes to a court in Manila, the regional trial courts of Makati, Manila. Yet SGS um, sought to elevate that to a um, treaty breach and therefore effectively circumvent or not pursue the McCarty Manila proceedings um, and pursue them under the um, terms of the investment treaty um, jurisdictional provision, i.e. transforming a local McCarty Manila claim into an ICSID claim. Um, they were partially successful. Um, but only partially successful in that they were um, the case was stayed for a number of years um, to allow the domestic um, mechanism to be um, used um, and, and subsequently there was a settlement. But that is there's, there's a lot of writing there. You know, that that is the normal that's the normal basis on which um, treaties um, this, this sort of umbrella clause provision would operate. Um, so with that, Matthew, I think I will turn over. I will turn over to you. You are now, I think, picking up the baton from me um, in slide twenty-three. Thank you, Matt, and good afternoon, all, and um, and and thank you also to our friends at KCAB International for uh, for hosting us today. Um, so I am, um, in fact, going to move on to. The case study, the idea being to try and make this a little bit more concrete and, and show how some of the considerations that come in um, in practice when one's looking at a potential treaty claim. So the scenario is set out on the next slide. Um, so the basic scenario we're, we're looking at um, is that Korea has a treaty with a fictional third state, ABC Republic, uh, signed in 2008. There is then um, a invitation to tender in 2009 to construct and operate a power station in which the Korean investor participates. And during that bidding process, a government representative uh, indicates orally um, that the Korean investor will be able to sell electricity at 50 ABC dollars per kilowatt hour for 15 years. There is a 50-50 JV in place um, with a local entity um, 
to, to participate the bid which the Korean investor um, and the JV subsequently win. So after um, the construction um, of, the, of the power plant from 2013, the JV starts selling electricity at the rate of 50 ABC dollars per kilowatt hour. There is then an announcement by a minister of an intention to introduce new legislation, which would reduce that rate to, to $10 per kilowatt hour, which would of course have a substantial effect on the profitability of the joint venture agreement. If we move to the next slide, this brings in potential restructuring. So the Korean investor considers its options at this point and discovers that there are more favorable investment protections in a treaty uh, between ABC Republic and Malaysia, and is therefore considering inserting a Malaysian company into the corporate train with, with a view to potentially bringing a claim under that treaty. Relevant clauses in the, the Malaysian treaty include the usual definitions of investor, but there is, as you see at the bottom of the slide, what we call the denial of benefits clause, which, which Matt um, also referred to earlier, uh, where they, uh, this, the contracting party reserves the right to deny benefits to an entity which is owned or controlled by an investor of another state, um, which has no substantial business activities in the territory of the state where it's incorporated. If we move then to the next slide, the issues that come up as a matter of jurisdiction in, in light of this potential restructuring are essentially two. The first is whether ABC Republic will be able to deny the benefits of the treaty to the Malaysian investor if, if it brings a claim on the basis that it's owned or controlled by a Korean investor and has no substantial business activities in Malaysia. There is a divergence in the case law um, under as to how exactly a state exercises this kind of denial of benefits. Some cases have indicated that if a state wishes to do so, it has to exercise that right prospectively, uh, that is before an investment is even made, for instance, in an, an announcement in a, in a gazette. Um, other cases have said it's okay for a state to exercise that right um, as long as it is exercised promptly after the investment claim is notified. There is also um, some case law around the meaning of substantial business activities. Um, clearly a pure mailbox company is not sufficient, um, but there is no requirement that there is a very large uh, uh, base of activity. Relevant considerations include whether there are employees, designated premises, bank accounts for that entity, etc. The other risk um, is the abuse of process one, which uh, Matt referred to, including um, with, with a reference to the Philip Morris decision. Um, and there are really two uh, key points there. The first is at the time of the restructuring, so when the Malaysian entity was incorporated, was the specific dispute foreseeable? Um, now, given that the possible legislation had been announced at that point, I think it, it would appear that that test may, be, may well be satisfied. In addition, there's a question of whether there was <coughs> another legitimate business reason for the restructuring beyond simply gaining access to investment treaty protection. So the risk here is that the Malaysian investor may not be entitled to, to uh, commence a claim as a matter of jurisdiction. I think the main takeaway from this slide um, is that it's important for investors when they are making investments in states where they consider there to be significant political risk, they've got long-term projects which are exposed to those sorts of risks, um, to, to consider the investment planning at that stage and not, not after a dispute has arisen. If we move to the next slide. So then um, our, our fact scenario develops um, and there is a public consultation on the proposed legislative changes. The JV participates um, 
in that process, but it's ultimately unsuccessful and the Act is passed in 2020, reducing the, the uh, tariffs considerably. In terms of relevant clauses in the treaty, um, there is a fair and equitable treatment clause, there is a non-expropriation clause, and a national treatment clause, all of which Matt has uh, referred to. So if we move then to the next slide, considering whether the Korean investor might be able to make out a breach of, of one of these clauses. So the heart of the claim is likely to be a fair and equitable treatment one. Um, as G Jay He said, this is the most commonly relied on uh, standard for an investor and indeed the most often successful. Um, and this is likely to turn on the question of legitimate expectations. And in particular, there are three points the Korean investor will need to establish. First, that there was a promise or assurance which gave rise to a reasonable expectation. Uh, second, that the investor reasonably relied on that. And third, that the, the ABC Republic has frustrated that expectation. As to whether there is a reasonable expectation, um, this is, of course, an extremely fact-sensitive inquiry, which will, will turn on, on the particular facts of, of, of each case. It is not necessary for there to be a specific representation to an individual investor. Um, there can be expectations created by general legislation, for example. But as a general rule, the more specific the representation is um, to a in particular investor, the, the, the stronger the chances of, of proving a reasonable expectation. And indeed, it's well established that simply because there is general legislation when an investment is made, that doesn't of itself give rise to an expectation that the legislation will not be changed. Um, of course, governments have the right to and often do change their legislation. At the same time, tribunals have found that in the context of capital intensive long term projects in particular, there is an expectation of a certain reasonableness in changes and a reasonable regulatory environment that shouldn't fundamentally shift the goalposts after an investment is made. So, um, in, again, applying to the facts, whether the, the representation was simply oral will be a relevant fact, whether in fact it was backed up by some sort of comfort letter to the investor, for instance, or other written document which, which might assist in proving that it was, it was reasonable to rely on that assurance. Um, as to uh, the government's frustration of the expectation, a tribunal will weigh up the purpose of legislative changes um, and also the proportionality of such changes. Uh, secondly, the investor would likely try to claim uh, expropriation in this circumstance. Uh, as Matt says, that requires some very substantial interference that essentially destroys the value of the investment entirely. So that um, will of course be, be very fact dependent and also um, an assessment um, undertaken with, with in consultation with experts such as James and, and FGI as to whether there has in fact been a substantial destruction of the, the value of the investment. Um, as to whether there's a national treatment claim, on, on its face that doesn't look obvious from the facts that we've seen because there's no, no suggestion of differential treatment for Korean investors and indeed a 50-50 joint venture partner um, from ABC Republic appears to have received the same treatment. So it's likely to be uh, an expropriation and or FET claim. If we move to the next slide. So just in, in, in short and in overview, when a dispute arises that involves some kind of interference from, by a state or state entity, um, the key thing is to analyze all of the options um, and in the round, um, typically, um, we, we, uh, when we work with Korean um, clients, they're, of course, extremely quick to identify the potential contractual causes of action. Um, and other things being equal, those are often the most straightforward remedy and, in, and, and, and sometimes the most efficient remedy. But they do have limitations, um, particularly 
if the contract is governed by local law and, and jurisdiction um, has, has, has been given to the local courts where the Korean investor may not have confidence of a fair hearing, or indeed if the measure that really causes the problem is not by the contractual counterparty, but by a part of the state um, in interfering with the contractual rights or the, the legal framework for the investment. In those circumstances, an investment treaty claim um, may um, firstly allow you access to a more uh, favourable forum, but also provide other substantive protections which are not available um, for, through contractual uh, enforcement routes. Um, and it's often a helpful um, strategy to at least have a prospect of an investment treaty claim on the table if one is seeking to negotiate with the government um, to, to resolve a, a matter amicably. Investors will often send a trigger letter notifying government of a potential treaty claim without having decided they are yet going to see it through simply as a way to bring the government to the negotiating table. So I think um, with, with that said, I will then pass over to, to James to cover the, uh, the, the damages aspects. Thank you. Apologies for that. I lost my mouse momentarily, uh, a moment of panic. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, I'm James Nicholson from FTI Consulting, and I'd like to add my thanks both to the KCAB and to Alan and Overy for inviting me to participate uh, in, this, uh, in this very interesting seminar, and also to all of you, the participants, for taking the time out of your schedules to, uh, to join us this afternoon. Uh, next slide, please, G. So very quickly about FTI Consulting. We're a global uh, consulting firm, four and a half thousand employees in 28 countries and 81 offices around the globe, including, as you see, a, a good representation across Asia, including in Seoul. Next slide, please. We help businesses and governments navigate a variety of complex issues, including corporate finance and restructuring, very busy at the moment. Um, technology, including e-discovery and computer forensics, uh, communications, sometimes around disputes, uh, forensic consulting, so asset tracing, etc. That team also includes business intelligence uh, and construction disputes consulting. And my part of the business, the economic and financial consulting team, which in Asia primarily is occupied with the quantification of financial loss, economic loss in a disputes context. So often the kind of disputes we're talking about today. Next slide, please. Um, our globally, our um, disputes team across valuation and economic disputes and construction disputes is the market leader. We have far more of the leading experts in international arbitration, according to this uh, go-to survey, than any other firm. Uh, by a factor of, of four. That brings us a scale and, uh, and, and uh, collective knowledge that, that, that we think is very useful for our clients. Uh, next slide, please. Across Asia Pacific, in the valuation oriented disputes team, we have 70 people uh, uh, spread across six offices. Uh, we have a team in Korea uh, offering uh, damages expert witness services led by Braden Billiers, who you see on this slide, and uh, thank you to Braden and his colleague Carlson for helping me with these slides today. We also, from Seoul, have a construction disputes team and offer some cyber security services. Okay, enough about FTI, onto the um, remedies in international arbitration. So discussion of remedies in international arbitration often starts with the Shorzao factory principle. Uh, which is a decision of the Permanent Court of International Justice in 1922. And this says that uh, the essential principle is that reparation for, for some breach must, as far as possible, wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and that it should, con be con and that it should consist of restitution in kind or, if that's not possible, payment of a sum corresponding to the value which a restitution in kind would bear. Next slide, please. Um, so, 
Um, we see the restitution in kind, the first box on the left. That is to re-establish the situation which existed before the wrongful act was committed. Now, for various reasons in investment treaty disputes particularly, that's often not possible either practically or politically for the, the state if they're on the losing end of, of the arbitration. And so one much more often sees compensation awarded by a tribunal and indeed compensation sought by a claimant in an investment treaty dispute. And that compensation is to put the claimant, is intended to put the claimant back in the financial position it would have occupied but for the wrongful act. There's a third type of remedy, which is to give satisfaction in the form of acknowledgement, expression of regret, etc., that one sees uh, less frequently as well. So from here, I'm going to focus on compensation. Next slide, please. And uh, damages are typically defined, so compensation as damages, typically defined as the difference between the actual value of a claimant's business or project and its value but for the alleged breach. And that concept of but for the alleged breach is, is the, the key join between the legal case that, that Matt and Matthew were talking about uh, a few moments ago and the quantification of the damages because it's the legal case that defines what actually did the government do that was a breach. And then it's um, the job of someone like me working with like Matt and Matthew to um, to define what that looks like from an economic point of view. What's the, what's the state of the, what state of the world would there have been if their breaches had not been, had not taken place? Often, uh, of course, whether there's a breach uh, is hotly contested. Often also the nature of the breach is hotly contested. A state might say, well, even if we, even if we didn't, even if we made some breach, we didn't make all of the breaches that, uh, that are being claimed here. And so that defines a different but for scenario, which would give rise to a different um, loss figure. Next slide, please. So within um, financial compensation, there are, there are two basic ways of framing the loss, known as reliance loss and expectation loss. And reliance loss, uh, is sometimes thought of as waste of expenditure. Which, and in, when you're assessing reliance loss, you simply say that the but for scenario, what would have happened but for the breach is that there would have been no investment. So it's a zero situation. And then the loss becomes the amount of money that has been invested and not recovered. And so that might be applicable if a party were building a power station and the, the contract to build the power station was cancelled two thirds of the way through and only 20% of, um, of the work had been, uh, had been paid. Uh, and one can envisage a number of other, of other scenarios, of course, where, where that kind of reliance loss or claim for wasted expenditure might be relevant. The other kind of, uh, of, of loss is expectation loss. This is more commonly known as lost profits. So when we're looking at expectation loss, we're looking at, um, in the but-for scenario, the money that the claimant would have made if the breach had not taken place. And then we're deducting from that the actual profits earned or loss suffered given the real state of the world, the actual state of the world given the breaches. Um, these two different ways of framing losses are alternatives to each other. A claimant cannot recover both reliance loss and expectation loss because they are based on different frameworks um, for damages. You don't get the money that you've sunk into a project and the profits that you would have made from the project back together because that would be overcompensation. However, claimants often do claim um, reliance loss and expectation loss in the alternative. Uh, and generally expectation loss is higher, it's more money than reliance loss. So generally claimants pursue an expectation loss claim and then they say, well, even if the tribunal is not persuaded on that for whatever reason, um, we've got a reliance loss claim, uh, a weighted expenditure claim. Next slide, please. So uh, just to illustrate this, the reliance loss um, is the amount of money wasted. It aims to put the claimant back in the position as if the investment had never been made. So in this uh, diagram, the reliance loss would give the claimant back the blue shaded area uh, on this chart. Next slide, please.
Um, so then when thinking about reliance loss, there are some advantages. There's a limited need to make projections about the future, which are always going to be hotly contested in a dispute context. There's generally less uncertainty about the calculations overall, particularly, again, compared to a lost profits or an expectation loss claim. And often the wasted costs are based on amounts that have actually been documented. They, they, the, the amounts that have been expended may appear in audited accounts. Uh, there are generally uh, invoices available. Um, there are generally proof of payment of those invoices available, et cetera. So, so the amounts going out are often um, e easier to, to document. Uh, the disadvantages are, as I've alluded to, is that, that wasted costs claim does not capture the future expected cash flows or benefits expected from a project. Of course, a party making an investment is doing so because it expects to create something that's worth more than the amount it's invested. And that's not captured by uh, a reliance loss or wasted costs claim. And uh, tribunals, when considering these claims, are often interested in was the cost incurred? Does the cost relate to the project? And was the cost incurred in reliance on the agreement? Next slide, please. A little more detail on expectation loss or lost profits analysis. So this, as I said, aims to put the claimant back into the position it would have been in had the investment been performed. So on this chart, the straight upward sloping line is the uh, cash flows of the claimant, but for the breaches. And the purple line that, that, that uh, defines the lower boundary of the blue shaded area is the cash flows given the breaches in this illustration. And the loss is meant, then the loss here would be quantified again as the blue shaded area. Next slide, please. Um, in quantifying expectation loss, there are two, there are two main approaches. The, ma the first one is uh, income-based approaches, and typically that is the discounted cash flow analysis approach, which I'll say a few words about in a moment. The other set of approaches is market-based approaches. And this, these uh, revolve around looking at the asset that, was, um, uh, that is the subject of the claim and assessing its value both but for the breaches and potentially given the breaches by comparing the value of that asset to the value of other assets that are similar. So uh, a classic example is in the hotel industry where hotels are often valued in terms of so many thousand dollars or, or one or, or whatever unit per room. And so if the project related to the expropriation of a five-star hotel, then one would say, well, other five-star hotels in that city are valued at $100,000 per room or, or whatever figure. And so how many rooms would the hotel that was expropriated have? Okay, so let's multiply that by $100,000 and that's the value of the expropriated asset. Similarly, that kind of comparable analysis can be done by reference to stock market valuations. Uh, yes, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, in quantifying expectation loss, loss profits analysis, discounted cash flow analysis is often used. Uh, this is a very widely used valuation tool in investment circles, in business circles, and uh, of course in, in damages circles. Uh, and the basic idea, as you see here, is to project the cash flows that the project would have or business would have generated year by year and then to place a value of those as of the valuation date by discounting. And the basic idea with discounting is to say that um, I'm going, if I'm going to receive $140 uh, in five years time, then what value do I place on that today? It's actually um, held to be worth less than $140 today because both um, of general business risk uh, and because if I have the money today, I can invest it and generate a return. And so I value $140 in five years time less than, uh, than I would value that same figure today. Uh, with discounted cash flow analysis, and I'm aware I should, uh, I should be wrapping up very soon, um, uh, it's a very finely tuned uh, method of valuation. Uh, to forecast the cash flows, one needs a lot of different assumptions. And in a dispute context, many of those assumptions can be contested by, um, by the other side. Often there's an expert working with the claimant and an expert working with the respondent, and there's vigorous discussion about many of the different inputs. Um, similarly, with the discount rate, 
uh, the financial economics underlying the discount rate is, is, is well understood and more or less agreed, but how to quantify the different inputs that go into deriving discount rate is also hotly contested. Um, so um, discounted cash flow is um, it's the, it's the, it's the racehorse of, uh, of valuation. It's, uh, it's, if you can get it to go well, it's the best technique, but it's temperamental, it's difficult, it needs to be implemented with a lot of care. Next slide, please. So uh, on the income method, the advantages uh, I've been through, discounted cash flow is flexible, it's adaptable, it's transparent, disadvantages is complex, it's sensitive to changes in assumptions. Tribunals in considering discounted cash flow uh, based damages claims are often and rightly interested in are the forecasts this is based on consistent with other evidence, with the historical performance of the business, with the performance of similar assets, with third party forecasts? Where did the projections come from and how accurate were the, were the, were the earlier projections? And even more generally, um, what was the likelihood of success of the project? If this was a project that wasn't already up and running and generating a profit, then there has to be a question about would the project have succeeded? We know many projects fail or don't achieve the financial aspirations of the sponsor of the project or the investor. Uh, can we go on? I'm aware I'm using up my time, so can we just flip forward to the conclusion slide, please? Thank you. So to summarize, there's th broadly three types of remedies available, restitution, compensation, and satisfaction. And of these, compensation is by far the most commonly claimed and awarded in investment treaty disputes. And the but for value versus actual value framework is the key framework for quantifying um, compensation. Damages can be relied on, it can be assessed either on a reliance loss basis, or a wasted expenditure basis, or an expectation loss or lost profits basis. Um, and uh, tribunals look for different things in assessing these losses. So it's important to think early, uh, how are you going to quantify your claim? How are you going to substantiate that? And uh, often to at least be consulting with a damages expert, someone like, like me and my colleagues and others in other firms uh, early on, so that you've, uh, if you're bringing a claim or resisting such a claim, uh, that, you, uh, that you make sure that you're framing it correctly and are going to have robust evidence to support it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. That was really certainly very helpful from my perspective. So we have just passed our hour, um, but we would like to cover a few questions. And I'm, we're very glad to see that many of you have chosen to stay with us past the hour. So thank you very much. And my first question is directed at Im Suyeon Samuchongjang-nim. Uh, Professor Shin mentioned during the opening speech that KCAB has successfully hosted a treaty arbitration hearing before. Could you kindly elaborate on that experience? Sure, thank you, Jay, for asking the question. Um, so Professor Shin mentioned that KCAB has been active in various projects and efforts to raise the awareness of the utility of investment treaty arbitration. Um, now, currently, we do not um, administer KCAB investment cases per se. Uh, I know other institutions who started with commercial arbitration um, do a lot of investment arbitration, but KCAB, in terms of case administration, we are not still in that field. However, um, besides the academic efforts of publication and um, seminars and study groups, we also we also do uh, we also host or provide our facilities for cases uh, that are administered by other institutions for investment treaty cases uh, very recently this was before the covid-19 situation very recently the the 18th floor of our our facilities hosted a a um, investment treaty arbitration case that relates that had that was related to korea some of the witnesses were in Korea. Um, and uh, the idea that we had when we were assisting the parties in the tribunal was that although 
transparency is obviously one of the watchwords for reforms in the SD system. It's both in the interest of the investors and the state as well that the transparency is provided in a disciplined and orderly form. So um, instead of just opening like a cinema, we had what we did was that we blocked the facilities so that the people who are necessary for the hearings um, had had their security pass checked every time they come in and out. Uh, but at the same time, we provided a gallery and a different floor where the public, the reporters, etc., could come in without creating any disruption to the, the proceeding, but still viewing the whole proceeding through video um, throughout so that the, there would be a feeling of, of publicity. Um, an interesting thing that happened uh, during that particular case was that there was a joint request uh, from either side that the video streaming what could act would actually have a 15 minutes lag. So although something happens in the hearing room, the tribunal says something, the party counsel they present something, um, the data is transmitted with a 15 minutes lag to the gallery, and this was done so because if there is an inadvertent disclosure of something that was that was not that was agreed not to be disclosed um then the council or the tribunal would have some time of some time in order to um, address the situation so that was one interesting thing that we were able to provide um, but overall we understand that the states and the investors although they are open to transparency discretion and um, particular attention to the sensitivity of the case must be provided and um, i believe that kcb was has had done a quite satisfactory job in that front um you know we don't uh, we don't expect in we don't expect um, on-site hearings this year, obviously, for the, the, the sanitary situation, but we do provide uh, virtual hearings as well. Um, so that's also a place to watch. Thank you very much, Paul chung that was, that was really helpful. And I'm sure many of you are aware, but KCAB and Seoul IDRC have beautiful state-of-art hearing facilities. So we look forward to having our hearings, both commercial and treaty, uh, at some point soon. Now, that's a very, Jehi, can I just say one thing? Yes, um, of course. See, Lim, that's a very interesting point you made about the 15 minute time lag. Um, um, I can see that's actually a clever and simple um, way of effectively screening confidential information. So I understand the way it would work is that council were aware that there was a 15 minute time lag and one of the juniors on the team, I suspect, was monitoring the transcript. And um, what would they do? Um, a redact? How, how would it work if one, if, if someone became aware of something that should not go public in the 15 minute period? Mm, well, well, this was a case administered by another institution, um, yeah. and what I understood was that if something happens, an accident happens, um, thankfully nothing happened in that particular case, but what, how I understood was that uh, the, the tribunal and the parties will decide whether they will suspend the hearing for a while and decide whether they will um, either redact it or um, or, or transfer it in a way that uh, that screens out the sensitive information. The, the specific mechanics, I think, um, would be something that would be decided depending on the type of information um, and what the parties and the tribunal agree. So I, 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 that's, I think that's, it's a bit case, case by case assessment. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And we received this question from our audience and it's, I think I'll direct it to Matt, Matthew and perhaps James can also chip in. Is ISDS superior to commercial arbitration in terms of cost, time and transparency? So calls for a bit of a comparative exercise. Shall I, Jaehee, shall I go first? So cost, time and transparency. Um, I'm going to start with the classic lawyer's answer and say it depends. Um, I think no, though, in terms of cost and time, Matthew Hodgson is the absolute expert on 
empirical studies on cost and time in investor state arbitration. But generally speaking, and it is on a very general level, they do take a longer than your average commercial arbitration, although, of course, there are a lot of assumptions inherent in that concept of an, an average case. But generally, they take longer um, and they cost more, which is why, generally speaking, they are more substantial. Um, in terms of transparency, it depends what you are after. Um, most, um, one way, the subject in itself, but most investment in investor state cases um, are either directly public or materials in respect of them become public indirectly. Um, so it depends whether you wish for there to be a transparent process or not. Matthew, do you want to jump in there? Thank, thank you, Matt. Yeah, not, not, not a great deal to add to that. I mean, I think it's I mean, generally right that commercial arbitrations in most cases are more efficient and, and probably more cost effective. I think people consider treaty arbitrations really when it is simply the best substantive option because the commercial route has problems, including, as we discussed earlier, because there's a local court jurisdiction clause or because the problem is not really with the commercial counterparty, but with the state. Um, but it's not really, they're not going to ISDS because it's cheaper or quicker. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And um, for the members of the audience, if you would like to see Matthew's empirical study on cost and time of treaty arbitration, that's available on our Lennon Ovary website and will be circulating. We can also circulate the link if helpful. Uh, just final question, if we can squeeze it in. It's a hot topic at the moment. Could government actions in response to COVID-19 crisis lead to potential treaty claims? Can I invite some brief answers to that question, please? Sure. Well, perhaps I, I will lead off on that, Jay. Here, I mean, I think we have to distinguish between two kinds of uh, scenarios for the potential claims. There are those. Um, arising out of immediate measures that governments have taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which of course have, have been quite severe and, and, and unprecedented in, in some cases. Um, whilst uh, there are possible claims, and I think um, there have been threatened claims against Ecuador and, and Mexico in this regard, the starting point is, as you would expect, that states have substantial discretion to regulate, including for public health purposes. Um, so an investor will have to overcome that starting point proposition. Um, they may be able to do so if, for instance, the measures taken are in fact plainly discriminatory, for example, or they're not in fact properly motivated by dealing with the, 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 the pandemic, which I think is what the investors are claiming in, in the context of Mexico and Ecuador. Um, so one can imagine a limited number of claims potentially in, in relation to immediate COVID pandemic measures. I think more interesting and, and possibly where more claims will lie is in the medium to longer term as governments take measures to try restore their balance sheets, um, which have of course taken uh, quite a bashing as a result of these extraordinary measures. And what we've seen from financial crises in the past, including localised ones in Argentina, for instance, um, or more general ones, the global financial crisis, is that sometimes after, when, when governments are looking to, to balance the books, um, foreign investors may be the easiest target um, and some long term projects, um, particularly in the natural resources space, but, um, but also other areas can be quite an easy target for, for changes. Um, and to the extent that those actions um, are either discriminatory, for instance, or breach of legitimate expectation that the investors have, they may give rise to treaty claims. And I suspect so that, that one will see over time cases in, in that latter category more than in the first category. Thank you. Um, Matt or James, uh, in Benosani, would you like to add anything to that? No. Perhaps. Just from a, from a loss quantification point of view on, on COVID-related claims, the, 
uh, I talked in the presentation about but the defining the but for scenario uh, and uh, that will in a COVID related claim will involve defining the world as it would have been but for the breaches but that will I presume in almost all if not all cases have to be a world in which the COVID pandemic has taken place so uh, a claimant won't be able to bring a claim for the profits it would have made if there was no pandemic. Um, it will only be able to bring a claim for the profits it would have made if uh, the government hadn't taken the complaint of actions, but the pandemic was still in place. And that may, depending on the circumstances involved, the government in question taking some different actions in response to, to, to the pandemic. Certainly governments uh, are likely to argue that in, uh, in, 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 in if they're facing such claims. All right. Well, th thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jehi, for leading the questions. Thank you so much for the speakers for your very thoughtful remarks. Um, we've actually are past our hour, uh, but I, I see that a lot of our attendees are still listening. I thank you so much, uh, the attendees and also speakers for being part of this and um, that I learned so much myself. Um, and for the, the attendees, um, please stay on and uh, please stay for our, please stay tuned for our next installment of the KCB and Friends webinar series. And um, I hope to see you again in our next webinar. Thank you and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye.